Mr. Whistler's Ten O'Clock by Oscar Wilde Paul Mall Gazette, February the 21st, 1885 Last night at Prince's Hall, Mr. Whistler made his first public appearance as a lecturer on art, and spoke for more than an hour with really marvellous eloquence on the absolute uselessness of all lectures of the kind. Mr. Whistler began his lecture with a very pretty aria on prehistoric history, describing how in earlier times hunter and warrior would go forth to chase and foray, while the artists sat at home making cup and bowl for their service. Rude imitations of nature they were first, like the gourd bottle, till the sense of beauty and form developed, and in all its exquisite proportions the first vase was fashioned. Then came a higher civilization of architecture and armchairs, and with exquisite design and dainty diaper the useful things of life were made lovely, and the hunter and the warrior lay on the couch when they were tired, and when they were thirsty drank from the bowl, and never cared to lose the exquisite proportion of the one or the delightful ornament of the other. And this attitude of the primitive anthropophagus philistine formed the text of the lecture, and was the attitude which Mr. Whistler entreated his audience to adopt towards art. Remembering, no doubt, many charming invitations to wonderful private views, this fashionable assemblage seemed somewhat aghast, and not a little amused, at being told that the slightest appearance among a civilized people of any joy in beautiful things is a grave impertinence to all painters. But Mr. Whistler was relentless, and, with charming ease and much grace of manner, explained to the public that the only thing they should cultivate was ugliness, and that on their permanent stupidity rested all the hopes of art in the future. The scene was in every way delightful. He stood there, a miniature Mephistopheles, mocking the majority. He was like a brilliant surgeon lecturing to a class composed of subjects destined ultimately for dissection, and solemnly assuring them how valuable to science their maladies were, and how absolutely uninteresting the slightest symptom of health on their part would be. In fairness to the audience, however, I must say that they seemed extremely gratified at being rid of the dreadful responsibility of admiring anything, and nothing could have exceeded their enthusiasm when they were told by Mr. Whistler that no matter how vulgar their dresses were, or how hideous their surroundings at home, still it was possible that a great painter, if there was such a thing, could by contemplating them in the twilight and half closing his eyes see them under really picturesque conditions and produce a picture which they were not to attempt to understand much less dare to enjoy then there were some arrows barbed and brilliant shot off with all the speed and splendour of fireworks at the archaeologists who spend their lives in verifying the birthplaces of nobodies and estimate the value of a work of art by its date or its decay, at the art critics who always treat a picture as if it were a novel and try to find out the plot, at dilettanti in general and amateurs in particular, and, o oh mea culpa, at dress reformers most of all. Did not Velasquez paint crinolines? What more do you want? Having thus made a holocaust of humanity, Mr. Whistler turned to nature, and in a few moments convicted her of the Crystal Palace, bank holidays, and a general overcrowding of detail, both in omnibuses and in landscapes. And then, in a passage of singular beauty, not unlike one that occurs in Corot's letters, spoke of the artistic value of dim dawns and dusks, when the mean facts of life are lost in exquisite and evanescent effects, when common things are touched with mystery and transfigured with beauty, when the warehouses become as palaces, and the tall chimneys of the factory seem like campaniles in the silver air. 
finally after making a strong protest against anybody but a painter judging of painting and a pathetic appeal to the audience not to be lured by the aesthetic movement into having beautiful things about them mr whistler concluded his lecture with a pretty passage about fuziyama on a fan and made his bow to an audience which he had succeeded in completely fascinating by his wit his brilliant paradoxes and at times his real eloquence of course with regard to the value of beautiful surroundings i differ entirely from mr whistler an artist is not an isolated fact he is the resultant of a certain milieu and a certain entourage and can no more be born of a nation that is devoid of any sense of beauty than a fig can grow from a thorn or a rose blossom from a thistle that an artist will find beauty in ugliness le beau dans l'horrible is now a commonplace of the schools the argo of the atelier but i strongly deny that charming people should be condemned to live with magenta ottomans and albert blue curtains in their rooms in order that some painter may observe the sidelight on the one and the values of the other nor do i accept the dictum that only a painter is a judge of painting i say that only an artist is a judge of art there is a wide difference as long as a painter is a painter merely he should not be allowed to talk of anything but mediums and megalip and on those subjects should be compelled to hold his tongue it is only when he becomes an artist that the secret laws of artistic creation are revealed to him for they are not many arts but one art merely poem picture and parthenon sonnet and statue all are in their essence the same and he who knows one knows all but the poet is the supreme artist for he is the master of colour and of form and the real musician besides and is lord over all life and all arts and so to the poet beyond all others are these mysteries known to edgar allan poe and to baudelaire not to benjamin west and paul de la roche however i should not enjoy any one else's lectures unless in a few points i disagreed with them and mr whistler's lecture last night was like everything that he does a masterpiece not merely for its clever satire and amusing jests will it be remembered but for the pure and perfect beauty of many of its passages passages delivered with an earnestness which seemed to amaze those who had looked on mr whistler as a master of persiflage merely and had not known him as we do as a master of painting also for that he is indeed one of the very greatest masters of painting is my opinion and i may add that in this opinion mr whistler himself entirely concurs End of Mr. Whistler's Ten O'Clock by Oscar Wilde Read by Noel Badrian